But um, part of what this is, is for students. So you're not students, but it's got nice images. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm an architect, I'm a designer, I'm a product designer, I make things, I make gimbals, I make sort of robotic mm -hmm. components, but I'm not a programmer in a deep sense. I can, you know, make a PCB and boot like the ground where I get things flashing and whatever, and moving, but I'm not, I'm not a programmer, I'm a maker. And so what, what I'm going to show you here is loads of slides really fast, like really fast, <laughs> Then I'm going to show you what I'm actually trying to do. Um, so I, I run a research, applied research group called Ecological Interaction. And I hope that the slides go next. So I'm, I'm interested philosophically in how we use e ecological indicators as drivers for the way we make things. Right? Ecological indicators as drivers of technology choice. So I work here, which is in the Fab Lab in Taipei. It's the Expo Dome in the, in the center in uh, Yuan Shan, in the middle of Taipei. I ran the university, which is outside of Barcelona, and that's where a Fab Lab is, the Green Fab Lab. So I was there living in that forest for 10 years in a Land Rover. And then <laughs> the far right one is my farm, which is in the further south of Catalonia. Barcelona is very interesting because they try to put people's factories in every neighborhood for like a hundred years. So having digital manufacturing in every neighborhood is quite interesting. So I, I ran that one up in the top and we make technology, share designs and make together essentially. I told you it's going very fast. Uh, it's beautiful, it's lots of green stuff. Didn't always look like that. That's because of our land use management. Yeah? So there's different choices in the way we can use the land. Historically, the Fab Labs are nothing new. Right? Monks did this a long, long time ago, sharing design, sharing stuff. Huh. Okay, I'm going to go really fast now. So what we're trying to do here is make the whole place materially, nutriently self-sufficient, as far as so we can do that. We don't want to cut off the sun, right? So you can't always be self-sufficient, but as cyclical as possible in a material manner. So making PCBs out of stuff that you find in the forest. Primary resource sector, that's what I'm interested in. Nobody's interested in that. Everyone wants to be a manager. <laughs> yeah? So I'm interested in the things that we should have done a long time ago but didn't. I've made four laboratories there. So what I'm showing you is like types of inventory. So inventory for biology, inventory for fabrication. I'm interested in agrology, well, agroecology. This is the Part of the lab is the structures made out of mycelium 10 years ago, uh, beehives that I'll come to. Um, so, yeah, make it, all of this is open source stuff, of course, like these beehives are downloadable, hackable. Uh, this also is part of the Center for Architecture. So this, at the time, this was the tallest 3D printed wall made out of local clay in the world until it fell down. <laughs> yeah, not cooked, it was bound by, by bacteria. Uh, that's why it fell down. Uh, this, this is Ya Cheng, who is my favorite Taiwanese person in the world. We were gonna get married until recently, but we're very good friends. So. <laughs> COVID happened. Uh, we made that during COVID lockdown, so I had 30 students there, and we made the house. Okay, so this is most of my life. It looks pretty messy, uh, working with bees and distillation units and robotics and stuff. Um, it's interesting when you work with ecology and farming, because nothing's on time. It has its own rhythm. So you have to work with the rhythm of the ecology, rather 
are within the rhythm of society. Mm. What one drives the other. So I'm, I'm very interested in ecology of the first as a, as a systems approach. Uh, but I do a lot of data capture and try to get a lot of data points. So these are, these are just mapping of things, species around, what works with what and why. Uh, taking that to the bacteria level. This is using LIDAR, 3D LIDAR to measure the biomass of forests, identify individual trees, understand carbon capture rates. Um, so it's that sort of thing which is my research rather than building houses with lockdown students. Uh, but it's quite fun anyway. So I'm interested in the technologies or the ways of seeing the lenses that can sort of help us understand ecology outside of our own spectrum. And very quickly, projects. So I design these things. You can make, make them on CNC machines, download them. Um, customize them, update them. These are beehives which are good for bees and make the work of the beekeeper harder. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's really what I'm interested in. I'm also interested in how you share this information, specifically. So what sort of files, how do you do that in Git? How do you make it accessible? How do you then sort of make it replicable? easy ways, cheap ways, DIY ways, and then using citizen science to monitor different types of species or ecology. So in this case it's beehives, we're looking for repeat signals in the audio data, and then trying to map that with ground truth to bee behaviours. So that's quite interesting when you take it on a large scale, because we get repeat signals, but we don't know what they are. And then you need the ground truth of a beekeeper to actually say, yeah, they're doing this. But we can predict swarming patterns now, which is quite interesting. So there's a fair amount of data science on the back of that. This is a major project. I work with the European Commission with uh, micro farms, so small organic farms. There's more small organic farms in Europe than there are big conventional farms. They're just small. And when you think of small, you think of idyllic, right? You think of like permaculture and flowers and stuff. But the reality is the shape of that farmer's back. <laughs> Not for back from <laughs> I'm doing that with yeah. So. A lot of farmers in Europe, after four years, give up because of musculoskeletal issues, uh, but also the, the romance uh, wears off. <laughs> um, so I'm interested in complex agricultural systems, because that's what that is. You can have farms with over 70 different species in them, in five hectares, and managing that is very, very intensive the labour is intensive too. But if we made that something even more complex, like an agroecology of many, many layers involving trees and animals too, uh, it's good. This is something that the European Commission, the United Nations and Global Consensus has aligned on. Uh, the agroecology is interesting. But we still don't know how to do it. So robotics with lines of crops doesn't make sense. You've got a robot that can be customized to do anything, you don't want to give it something simple, then you give it something complex. Yeah. So complex agroecology systems work very well with mass customization. That's what the robots and stuff that we do look like. Uh, but we actually sort of design polyculture systems, uh, analyze all of those things, try to be lazy. Uh, and the way that we do that really interestingly with you guys is to create virtual plant models informed by the genome, then create synthetic data sets that we can then create noise and mutation on, and then test that with real plants in the field. So create a synthetic data set that 
10,000 virtual plants rather than scanning 10,000 real plants to create the machine learning algorithm. It works. What this means is we can weed, we can operate around plants in the field, we can create maps, uh, we can do analysis, all open source, phenotyping. So this is phenotyping scanner creating models of a plant and then you do, do segmentation on that. That's good for botanists rather than farmers, but they come together. Data infrastructures, dashboards, with different types of lenses. That's only looking at chlorophyll, NVDI analysis. Okay, so this is what we call computational agriculture. So computational agroecology. Something that's beginning to happen but is not really there yet. And we make tools and stuff. We basically <laughs> make open source robots for that. Now what I want to show you really is this project. And I got that domain name 12 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's a little bit ubiquitous, uh, and what I will show you is basically just a mock-up, although it's there on Git, yeah? and I've started this project maybe three times, and I've never been able to do it because it's so big. But what I'm doing is, if you, if you have abiotic resources, biotic resources in a map sense, and you've got a way to look at, or if you can, you can categorize just the, the need input. Now what I've got is databases and databases and databases of open source hardware. Stuff that works in refugee camps. How to build a building that doesn't fall down when there's an earthquake. Mm -hmm. How to make adobe bricks out of different types of clay in different types of regions. What to do with different types of latex? You know, all of the different sorts of plants offerings that we can get from the growing world, they don't grow everywhere. They grow regionally, bioregionally. So what does it mean when you create a distributed network of regional, bioregional similarity? So this, this is a, a, a map of anthropogenic bio. This was before the word anthro Anthropocene became unfashionable. So what it really means is that it's evidence of human activity in the rock. So I'm going with the geological term of it rather than the sociological one. So an irrigated village, a rain-fed irrigated village, is a thing. It's a place that literally can only exist by capturing the rain. And so there they are, right? And there they are, with this massively different cultural expressions of how to do that, technologically or in process. So what would it mean if you connect the knowledge here with the knowledge here, with the knowledge here, with the knowledge here? It's a distributed network of regional similarity driven by ecological indicators. So this is an earthquake risk map. Now partly my job in the past, when I was working with the UN, was to be the intermediary. So I've been to South America, I've been to well, Central America, I've been to uh, well, the Middle East, and I've been over here as well, recently, very happily. Okay, so the ways of de dealing with earthquakes are massively different in construction. And historically, somebody would go and get that information and go to another place and give it to them. In a colonial sort of way. Hmm. Cut out that person, just put the information up there, and allow a distributed network of regional similarity to find each other without words. So all you need is a map. You geolocate yourself, you come up with a whole load of mapping data qualities, and 
and then you can find others within that similarity, without words, without language. It's done in that way. So I'm going to show you what I mean. So this is this is a mock-up, right? So if I if I, if I do some, what shall I do? So on one side, I can have my, this is a platform, right? So I can have a profile of myself. And this is my profile. So I can offer ser services. I can offer a design service. I could offer a fabrication service as a fab lab or a maker space, or I, ju I just happen to have a metal cutter. I could offer tuition, consultation, or I could actually offer parts as well. You can share the bits of information. You can't share the atoms globally so easily. Right? So local production, local manufacturing is, is, a, is a good target. So if I'm able to find somebody locally who can offer me the things that I need, that's a good thing anyway. So that's, that's people, but then on the other side, there's projects. So in much the same way, it's, it's, a, it's an amalgamation of information. So if I go to a project, I could, this is a solar cooker, it's going to work in some places but not in others, super basic technology work. But I could attach my design services to that. I could attach the fabrication to that, or the consultation. So all of these sort of satellite abilities could be attached to people as well as projects. So up here I've put it, people, place, and production. That's the concept here. Cut out the middle person and allow people to collaborate on open source hardware. So there, there now exists platforms like Acropedia, uh, Wikifactory, I know these guys, you know? Um, and there's the Fab Lab Network as well that sort of attempts to do this, just GitHub, GitHub for hardware. But this I think is a little bit more than that. Because you can share and merge components, you can upload components, you can version them. I've just done this in a wiki sort of demonstration, right? but it would be attuned for design. Not, this is not Etsy, it's like CAD, right? But then each component can also have instruction chains, so of IKEA manual, like we know about this already, okay, and what is to get to services. So I mean, if I'm interested in Bongeni Mugalubi, fantastic name, my good friend from Zimbabwe, there he is, maybe I could barter with him, I could do bitcoins with him, I could pay, whatever. Okay. But to be frank, I'm not interested in that so much. What I'm interested in is the geo. So if I, if I put my geolocation somewhere in Spain and I say, okay, I've already understood just from my place that I have some conditions, some mapping data, some GIS data, particularly GIS data that relates to construction or materials or nutrients. Okay, so if I say I'm in the Mediterranean, that is a climate zone. Mm. I'm, also, I'm also sharing that climate zone in the southern hemisphere. Right? So I'm able to find people that I wouldn't necessarily know how to connect with through the shared climate. Okay, but then I've also got all of these other ones. So I'm also in a dense urban environment. So I could narrow it down. I could say I'm in the Mediterranean and a dense urban environment. 
to me, in my mind, that equals malaria. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's all sorts of you know compounding third associative aspects. The more you tunnel in, the more similarity, the more likely you are to find potential solutions or pathways to to suit your your location or your need. So then again, it's the same thing. If I go to a different place in the world, there's different conditions, but I can now find a distributed network of people who share the risk of earthquake. And I don't need to contact the United Nations. I can talk, yeah, I can talk from somebody in Aleppo or, or Peru um, or wherever it may be and find out how they felt or what problems that they might have. Okay, so this is this is my interest, is how to make that GIS system operable. And I can't do that, I don't have those skills. But I've got the data, and I've got the hardware, and so I just need to put it out there in intelligent ways. Because it was my job previously to be the person to share the technology. And it's, it doesn't, it's, not, it's not right, honestly. So, so that's, that's what I'm interested to do. That's open lab. Uh, it could be called something else. But when you put that together with modern mapping technology from drones, from satellite data, you know, all sorts of image capturing. I mean, there's metagenomic analysis of bacteria, of microbiomes, of the soil, which matter. So that sort of data should go in here. Uh, so when I was showing this, it's literally like basic maps. But if it's citizen science working with soil <coughs> data, that's, that's a huge thing to start. Yeah, so that's, that's that's why I'm here. Yeah. Yeah, so any any questions? This is exactly the thing that I think we should do in terms of when I mentioned decolonized technology. Yes, mm. you say we don't go back to a centralized stuff. Mm. So I totally resonate with that. Like, if you're going to build construction, I'm from Taiwan, and then we everything we have to think about is what if earthquake comes, what if uh, typhoon comes. So, but because we are in Asia, so we usually go to see Japan because they also share earthquake and typhoon. But if you told me some one thing that were in Latin America, they share uh, hurricanes and an earthquake too. And then yeah. There was something we can learn from. Yeah, there's always something. Like, it, like it, in, in Italy, I was part of the, the earthquake relief for L'Aquila. Mm -hmm. And so they've got the similar problem that they're having now in Turkey, which is a lot of the, a lot of the buildings were made with false sand, right? So it wasn't sharp sand. It wasn't building materials. It was, it was basically mafia supplied sand from the beaches, which has got salt in it from the ground. So huh. it doesn't bind. So yeah. then what to do after that problem? That's also a problem, something that could be uh, fixed as well. Yes, that's a, that's a sure problem. Yeah. What do you, I, I guess like, um, I'm wondering how does it, because like it, my sense is a lot of the people who work in agriculture, oh, thanks, um, might be the least likely to be connected to these sources. So like, do, have you, like through your experience, have you found any ways to like get at reaching people who might not be the first to show up for a technology platform, even when it's, you know, even when it's really trying to address those concerns? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, in, in, terms of, in terms of agriculture, that's the majority of land use, right? So, what I, you see this, you see this one? Actually, this is not a good image. Let me just scroll down to 
this guy. Right. So this is this is my home. Yeah. Uh, there's my land. This is the land that I custodian. It's got my land, right? although I paid for it. <laughs> um, so these walls, some of them are a thousand years old in the region, and all of this land is abandoned for agriculture simply because they used to bring donkeys up here. Now the world is run by tractors. And tractors can't go up there. Yeah, so agriculture everywhere became flat. Now we can go beyond that. But in in this region, in this village, which is 700 people, it looks beautiful, right? But can you see? Can you see these flats down here? So these are the only parts which are now farm. All over Europe, all over the world, which isn't flat, right? It's difficult agriculture. People are leaving. So this is called rural shrinkage. And what it means is you get the old people there who are too old to leave. You get no middle generation because they've already left. And basically there's there's the young kids, but they will just so they sell the land, they leave, they abandon it. This has become so desperate that farmers, in my experience, have come around to try and eat. So they would rather be like, all oh, right, the young kids, they like games and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Let them try a new way. So it's already gone past this sort of phase of, Farmers don't get it. Farmers are desperate and don't do anything in reality. Uh, but yes, the old farmers who are still there, they'll never use that. They'll never use that term. But the young ones may. So did you transition from um, architecture into agriculture? Was in is this something that always interests you, or how did you join join them together? When I, I was working in Cuba um, with a group called CPOLS, which is uh, Continuous Productive Urban Landscapes, mm -hmm. a lot to do with urban gardens and community gardens. Mm -hmm. Cuba had gone through a pretty severe crisis of... What, what time did you go there? 2018. So, so they set up a lot of urban gardens. So right. the architecture, the urbanism, including the people, is one thing. Right. They're not separate. Um, any city is fed by the farm. Okay. And the farms are always, they're always um, But I just got more and more interested in it. Right. Just making it. How did you end up in uh, Catalonia, from all places? Um, <laughs> I went, to, I went there to work for uh, UN Habitat, mm -hmm. and that was a political sort of science division of UN Habitat. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was an architect, and then I found the Fab Lab, and then opened the Fab Lab. So I went, I went there to work for them, right. and then gave up. And you're still there? <laughs> <laughs> no, I moved out of Barcelona and moved south. Right. But you're still in Catalonia then? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's literally like in two days' time. I'll go back. Back there. Fix stuff and stuff. Yeah. Huh. Nice. Okay. Is uh. I'm just curious, like, are you imagining, like, I, I'm just thinking about connectivity in these places, and like, is Starlink a thing that's like important in your consideration of how your objective and your path kind of changes, like access, like high speed access in these like remote locations? Yeah. In in this, in this area, um, I'm able to get 4G connection, and I can have conferences using that. Okay. Um, there's also a, a, quite a lot of 5G work going on. But there's also a socially run internet provider called Giphy. Uh. And so they're basically beam around, transmit Wi-Fi around. Uh. 
Okay. I guess this is a whole layer of the map, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So co connectivity is massive. Yeah. But I would say geolocation is more important than connectivity. Just straight up. Okay. It's coming. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. No. Thanks. I, I guess I'll.